All right, we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. You are tuning into reasons why JavaScript developers should use charting components for data visualization hosted by Reason Charts. My name is Raj. Uh, I'm a marketing manager at IDEDA Fusion Chats, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I am pleased to introduce today's presenter, Stephen Miskok, a well-known YouTube influencer and developer. Before I hand the mic over to Stephen to kick off the webinar, I would like to take a moment to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and, and will be available on demand on YouTube platform. We are able to do uh, connect Q&A today with Stephen, or if you have any questions you can submit on the questions panel well with that let's kick off the presentation over to you stephen hey guys my name is steph in this video we're going to look at why javascript developers should use charting components for their data visualization needs so i've been writing commercial code since 1994 and the top three rules of development that i've learned since that time are Number one, reuse. Number two, reuse. Number three, reuse. So when you are writing code, the very first thing you should do is look to use other people's code to get the job done. So let me give you an example of a real world experience I had where using components, using third party libraries made a huge difference in my own development experience. So we're going to go way back in time. I was working on a social media project, an early version of a social media website. This is the late 1990s. And I was approached by a company who had hired a third party development company to build their social media site. So this other company had been working on the project for well over a year. And after a year of working on the project, they still couldn't get some fundamental functionality in the project to work properly. So in frustration, the uh, hiring company contacted me and they wanted to know whether or not I could fix the bugs that the creators of the software, the original site could not. So I went in and I uh, got access to the code base and it was written from scratch using, uh, it was Perl CGI. That's how we did a lot of web apps in those days was Perl CGI. So it was Perl CGI, and like so many projects in the day, everything from the database up through the view technology, the view layer, everything was written from scratch. Everything was custom made. Now, if you've been in a game for any period of time, one of the advantages of using third-party libraries and frameworks that are known is that, especially if they're popular, is that you're sure to find developers who are familiar with the technology, with the library, with the framework. And there's typically documentation and multiple contributors to this library or framework. So there are resources for you to access if you need to get in there and figure out what's going on. So unfortunately for my clients, the development firm, again, had used totally custom code from scratch for everything. So when going in there, unless you had worked on the project, it was really, really difficult to get your head wrapped around what was going on. To make matters worse, the developers were not using standard best practices, if you will, in terms of the way they constructed their software. So it was just a nightmare. It was just a nightmare. So after a year or so of them working on it, they still couldn't get it to work. So in comes me the hired gun, and I looked at the code base, and it was such a mess. Everything was custom. It was just too difficult to figure out. I looked at the scope of the functionality, and I assessed that I was would be able to reproduce it from scratch using a different technology within 30 days. And so my client was very skeptical about this. What I explained to them is that I was using a far more modern technology that leveraged a bunch of prefab components, a lot of prefab libraries that were built into the tech. And that's what I did. Um, and by today's standards, these, this component-based system was primitive compared to what we have today. But nonetheless, it was much better than what uh, my predecessors had used. 
So I got the contract and from scratch rebuilt the entire system without bugs or very few bugs, but it was fully functional in a fraction of the time. Instead of a year, I was able to do it in 30 days. That being said, because I knew exactly what the model was, I was I could see it, that probably accounted for part of the reason why I was able to develop more quickly. It's easy to copy. It's much easier to copy something that's already in existence than it is to develop from scratch where you're trying to figure out what exactly what exactly things should do. But anyhow, so I uh, was able to rewrite from scratch using a new technology. I was able to develop a far more robust and a far more uh, a fully feature complete system in a fraction of the time. Again, partly because I understood what the model was, but also a big part of it was because I was using a component-based system. Many libraries that the previous developers had developed from scratch, I was able to just leverage uh, what was uh, included in this uh, framework that I was using. So I didn't have to worry about authentication. I didn't worry about a database access. The view logic was all in place. Made my life much, much easier. So smart developers use other people's code in the terms of libraries and frameworks rather than trying to rewrite everything from scratch. And there are several reasons for that. So some of you might be saying, come on, Steph, we're coders. Shouldn't we be writing code? You are going to be writing code, guaranteed. One of the things I teach people is never look for code to write. Never do that. Always look to see who has done what, see what you can leverage in your own projects. There's several reasons for that. Let me jump into it. So the first thing you should come to grips with is that you are already using tons of code that other people have written. If you're using any of the high level languages, Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, Python, PHP, using SQL, using IDEs, you're using other people's code, right? Languages like JavaScript, are written or have were written or have been written in C, C++, Java, even JavaScript, of course. So if you're using anything but, I don't know, assembler or something, you're using other people's code. If you're using integrated development environments, you're using other people's code. If you're using a relational database like a SQL Server or Oracle, you're using other people's code. Just to emphasize that point, as a developer, I would suggest is, is that you think of yourself as a component user rather than a coder. Meaning, again, use third-party library. It could be Fusion charts for your charting. It could be MailChimp for your emailing and newsletter needs. It could be some third-party library for your database access. It could be an MVC framework like Django to create the, the bones of your web app or Express.js if you're in the node world, et cetera, et cetera. You got to think of yourself as a component user rather than a coder. That's really a modern day development work. Trust me, I've been at it in the past in the early 90s, mid 90s, where I was code first, library second. Now it's libraries, frameworks, APIs first. Then you write code if you have to. This, again, has huge advantages because of, as I just said before, less bugs, less development time, less uh, work to explore and figure out how the particular elements may need to be built, what functionality you may need. Uh, this is all advantageous to developers, and this is modern day development. Don't get me wrong, you still have to know how to code. You have to understand best coding practices, you know, how to create your classes and you know, so on and so forth. But when you sit down, components first, frameworks first, then write code to fill in the gaps and to make the connections between your APIs and your libraries and your frameworks. Back in the 1990s, when I first started writing web apps, I used to create my own databases. That's what we did. They were called flat file based database systems, just text files. And we would store our data in comma delimited files. And then we would parse this data manually a lot of times people were using Perl at the time, sometimes some C. When relational databases became accessible, MySQL comes to mind, Postgres later on, it changed the entire game. It made life so much easier. That's one example of using other people's code, how it's going to save you a heck of a lot of time, 
versus trying to build something from scratch. So I built databases from scratch and wrote a bunch of classes and methods to access that data. But this is a terrible, terrible thing to do because of compatibility issues, bug issues, so on and so forth. So yes, today, if you're using any modern tools, whether it be IDEs, app servers, libraries, frameworks, languages themselves, you're using other people's code. One of the big advantages of using outside libraries and frameworks is that you're going to have less bugs to contend with. You see, when you're using a third-party framework, especially commercial ones, you know that you've got a dedicated team of developers who have worked on it, refined it, worked out bugs. These are bugs you're not going to have to contend with. Whereas, for example, if you wrote a charting component in JavaScript, you would have to debug the whole thing all the time. So again, to reiterate, when you're using a third-party library, you are going to be using a code base that has been vetted by probably many developers. So this code base is going to be less buggy for sure than your own from scratch implementation. Another advantage of using a third party library is that it will save you a lot of time. So you can concentrate on the core functionality of your application. You have to decide for yourself what it is you're writing. So for example, long time ago, I had an educational SaaS. Well, I still do actually. One of the things I needed to do for the business was maintain a newsletter. You know, get subscribers, set up, submit, send out newsletters on a regular basis, et cetera, track opens, all this kind of stuff. So I wrote my own newsletter based system. It was fun. I wanted to do it. So hey, I'll do it. I'll write my own system as opposed to licensing a third party. This became a detriment to the project because I realized at some point that, hey, all this time I'm devoting on my newsletter system, I should be devoting that time into building my core application, which was the learning SaaS. I'm not in a newsletter business uh, game. That's not what I do. It's not core to the application's functionality. So I wasted a lot of time and a lot of money building out a newsletter system that had to be updated and maintained and so on and so forth. So I trashed it, shut that down, and we use a third party. Best move I could I could have made because it allowed me, again, to devote my time and efforts to, towards the core functionality of the application rather than trying to recreate a wheel that's already been created many, many times, the newsletter app. I wanted to re-emphasize a point I made. Using third-party libraries means you don't have to update that library and the functionality it provides, and you don't have to fix bugs there. Let's emphasize fix bugs. Remember, in the lifespan of any given piece of software, most of the coding is going to be done fixing bugs, updating things, refining functionality, and so forth. So when you do buy a third-party library, besides the initial time savings that you're going to get by using this third-party library, just you know, buy it, boom, drop it into your app, Bob's your uncle, you're ready to go. That's huge in of itself. That in of itself will probably save you a huge amount of time, thus a huge amount of money just in the initial development phase. But if you think about the lifespan of your product, if you are using a third-party library, again, where you don't have to create updates, you don't have to add functionality, you don't have to uh, correct for bugs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you've got a good third-party library, this is all done for you. The updates are done for you. Now, this could be a double-edged sword, admittedly, sometimes, where if uh, those who are ma maintaining a particular library framework, they're not doing a great job at it, but again, Typically, whether it be open source or private, you're going to have multiple developers who are just concentrating on making that library work. That is going to almost always be better off than you or your team trying to maintain some sort of support technology that's, that's key to your, your software, but not core to your software. It's always going to be, not to, I would say 99% chance, it's going to be much better to have a group of specialized developers who are just working on that library's functionality. 
So you don't have to take care of that. So you factor in that cost in addition to the initial development cost. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer to license a third-party library. If your goal is to get out a piece of software as quickly as possible, something about minimum viable products, especially where uh, your job is just to get yourself into the market as quickly as possible so you can assess what users want in your application. So you got to think about that debug time and the update time that requires for any component of your system, whether it's in, whether it's developed in-house or you just leverage a third-party library. In a nutshell, when you're using third-party libraries, you're leveraging a whole development team that you don't have to pay for, or you're paying a tiny fraction of the cost to use, to leverage their skills and expertise and their time. So again, your team can concentrate on the core functionality of the application that you're trying to deliver. As I just mentioned, one of the big advantages of using a third-party library is that you don't have to update them and maintain them to do bug fixes. This is huge. Again, it's about where do you want to focus your time? Are you, in my previous example, am I in the newsletter business? No, I was not in the newsletter business. I am in the educational SaaS business. So why am I wasting my time trying to perfect a newsletter system? That's a full-time gig. That's a lot of work. If I was in the newsletter business, that was my main goal of my product was to be able to send out newsletters, then it makes sense to uh, maybe roll out your own newsletter from scratch. But that's only if that's the focus. If it's a, a supporting functionality or feature of what you're doing, then I would license that for sure, saving a lot of money. So huge companies, as I said, as a matter of... Uh, standard process or procedure will use third-party uh, libraries and services and partners all the time because they've learned over the years uh, they're big because they understand that that's how you grow big is by leveraging uh, services outside of your core competency and so that you can uh, produce the product that you want to produce it works both in the software world and just standard manufacturing Think about cars, automobiles, for example. Did you know that the suspension used by BMW is used by other car manufacturers as well? In fact, a lot of car manufacturers will buy their raw components from other big players who specialize in a particular aspect of the car that you buy. So I believe BMW and off the top of my head, Genesis will use... A, a company called, I think it's Magma in Canada. I think it's Magma. Anyhow, it's Magma in Canada, I believe. And they provide the suspension for both these uh, manufacturers. Now, of course, Genesis will get in that uh, suspension and BMW will get in the suspension. And of course, each of the respective companies will tweak it according to their needs. But it, the point I'm trying to emphasize is even in terms of hardware, automobiles, Car companies will be outsourcing or leveraging other specialists in terms of the components that they put into their vehicles. Same thing with transmissions. I know there are some, I don't know the companies off the top of my head, but if you do a little bit of research, you see that there are a few companies out there that they just build, for example, transmissions. Some companies like Toyota will build their own transmissions, but other companies will leverage some third-party companies' transmissions simply because that third, car, that third party company, all they do is transmissions, so they're really, really good at building transmissions. And sometimes you see a company, they'll start off building their own transmissions, as an example, and then realize, wait a second, that company over there, we can buy a transmission for just a little bit more of an R cost, or even maybe less, but it's much better because that's all they do. Same thing happened to me. I mentioned this already where... I had to, uh, I need a newsletter type of functionality. And initially I had built my own newsletter system, but I quickly realized that it was going to be, going to be a very, uh, very costly. And there was going to be a, lot, a big commitment in me maintaining and building and refining the newsletter component of my application. Even though I was not in the business of creating newsletters, I said to myself, I don't want to create newsletters. That's not what I do here. It's not what I make money with. So I trashed my newsletter, own newsletter, and I just licensed somebody else's newsletter. 
In fact, I should have done that from the beginning because the amount of time and effort I put into building my own newsletter, I could have licensed a third-party newsletter for 10 years. You know what I mean? Anyhow, just another example of how even outside of software, smart companies will leverage third-party tools. And that's why I keep saying again and again and again in all my videos, reuse, reuse, reuse. Top three rules of coding is to reuse other people's code. Last thing you want to do is write code from scratch. You do that as the last thing you want to do. It's the last thing you want to do is write your own code from scratch. In a nutshell, modern day developers really are much more about leveraging components and stitching them together with code and architecture rather than just writing code. Coding is the last part of the process, in fact, in the software development game. Here's another very important reason why you should be considering third-party libraries over rolling out your own code. Let me just read what I wrote so I get the language exactly. You are almost guaranteed that an established library with all the contributors improving it over time will have identified and solved problems you would not even consider. So I had that, again, with my newsletter system. When I rolled it out and we were using it, it was working pretty good. I started running into uh, situations. I needed, oh, I needed this particular functionality here. I needed to extend that functionality there. Things I had not even considered when I started writing the newsletter. All these extra features that I discovered that I did need, I had to devote a lot more time into it than I anticipated initially, taking away from my core product, which didn't help me advance the, uh, the, go the goals of the business. So let's say you're working on your MVP app, your minimum viable product to get it out into the marketplace to see how people will respond to it. And you're looking out there and you can't find a library, a component that you can't find something that works perfectly given your vision. Let me give you a bit of advice based on my own personal experience. Oftentimes, your first idea about what exactly the app should do will not be 100% on target. You will probably get things wrong. That's why I tell people, and when I mentor people, I tell them, you want to get your product, you want to get your SaaS product up, out there. SaaS is short for software as a service. You want to get it out there as quickly as possible. Get it into the hands of the users so that you can start getting feedback. This again, where uh, components, libraries, APIs, etc., can come in handy because you can at least, at the very least, use a third-party library as a placeholder just so you can get the main the main vision, if you will, of your application out on out into the marketplace quickly. Again, the top priority for anybody who is developing, especially your alpha or your first iteration of an app, the first thing, the major priority is to get it out as quickly as possible. Don't be too married to a particular implementation detail. So even if you find a third-party library that doesn't do it exactly as you envisioned it, many times from my personal experience and as I've seen out there, with many, many other people, your original vision of exactly how the product should work will not be precise. So if you, for example, find a particular third-party library that gets you 90% of the way where you want to go, it's not 100%, just because it doesn't add that last 10%, that's not a reason to not use it. Actually, I would use it 100%. Why? Because, again, you may find once you actually have people using it, they may not care about that last 10% that you thought was so important. Or you may find that this library implements what it is you need for that aspect of the, your application. You may find that that library implements it better or in a way you hadn't considered before. Again, let me emphasize the business need of getting your app out as quickly as possible so you can uh, assess what the market demands from your particular application. If later on, for whatever reasons, on the off chance that the library doesn't work for you 100% and you really need that extra functionality, then you can start looking at that. You can maybe extend it. A lot of times you can extend libraries or you could just uh, build a facade on top of it uh, or adjacent to it. The main point to take away from this uh, section here 
is that you want to get your app out as quickly as possible. And the third party library is a way to do that. Even if the third party library initially, by your estimate, doesn't satisfy everything that you need, as long as it doesn't break the core functionality of your app, I'd say still use it, still use it. And from my experience, again, a lot of times you find that some particular aspect of the application that you thought was crucial, your users may not recognize that at all. Uh, so don't get too hung up on it. So yes, when you're using a third party library, you're going to be saving a lot of time. You're going to have far less buggy code or pro probably bug free code. And something you probably hadn't expected, they will already have figured out functionality and features that you may not have anticipated. They have probably already implemented it and it's there for you to not have to worry about. As an example of using a third party library that will save you time is uh, Fusion Charts. So for a very small cost, very small cost, especially when you compare it to how many man hours you have to put into it, coding hours, you can quickly create great looking and functional JS based charts that visualize your data. When you compare the development time and cost versus the licensing cost, it's not even close. It's not even close. So you can see the quality of the charts that you can produce with Fusion Charts, it will take you a huge amount of time to come even close to this. Creating visualized components or charting for your web app, this is something we were doing in the 90s. Now in the 90s, it was really, really difficult. There was a couple of solutions. You could just use some JavaScript and uh, hack out some bad looking charts. But that was a big job. I've done it personally. Nothing, by the way, nothing compared to what you see with something like Fusion Charts. Or the other option, I've seen in the late 90s, some early iterations of third-party components that provided charting applications. But in those days, uh, I've, I remember there was one that was developed on top of the Flash platform. And man, the licensing was crazy. It was like 50 to 100,000 US dollars to get access to this uh, the suite of tools that allowed you to just present, you know, dynamic bar graphs and pie charts and so forth. So thank God that technology evolves and gets cheaper and cheaper over time because I was just looking at Fusion Charts and all its capability that it provides for you. And it's the licensing cost is really next to nothing, uh, especially if you consider the cost that was put into initial development. So if you need to bring in dynamic visualization of your data and charting, take a look at Fusion Charts. It's just going to save you a heck of a lot of time. And as you see, lots of huge organizations are using Fusion Charts and other third-party libraries. So if you got the big boys using third-party libraries on a regular basis, you should too. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, Stephen. It looks like we have a questions here. If you are still with us, have a question, please submit it via question banner. Stephen, if All you right. can hear. Right. The first question we have here or the libraries or the type third party libraries you're suggesting is we should use open source or private. Um, both are relevant. It I found in my experience that uh, both open source options and private uh, are uh, can be very effective it really depends on the on your project so i wouldn't be i am personally not too concerned whether it's open source or commercial and in fact many times i tend to lean towards commercial because you get the support with a commercial product whereas open source uh, uh, can be difficult sometimes i appreciate that thank you very much that's the question we have today all right thank you so much for the presentation uh, everybody is still with us. I want to say thank you. Uh, in addition, you can rewatch the presentation anytime. It will be available on demand on YouTube channel. I would like to remind everyone today's webinar are recorded and will be receiving a follow up email with the recording shortly. Once again, thank you very much, and we look forward to joining us next time. Have a great day. Thank you.